I gotta work on my metal plane. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and I'm not a metal player, but I gotta work on it because I'm getting more calls for it. It's just like, what the heck? And I had like a Jackson guitar that was, I don't know, a friend gave me, and I uh, i don't know what happened to it. I, I, I asked Alex, I said, what did we do with that guitar? He couldn't remember. Um, I don't know that it was a very good one. It probably was an entry level. Um, and, you know, I don't really have any... I need to I need to get like a little bit heavier gauge because um, this one session I did um, on Friday was drop D for both the tracks and um, it's just a little squishy. I was playing the Gibson, which my understanding is it's a let's see Gibson's a little bit shorter scale than a Fender typically and um, so. The string was probably a little loose and pitchy. I was having a hard time playing in pitch. Hey, Charlie. Ice, ice coffee. Good to see you. David. Um, well, I'm going to stick on the G major diatonic one more day because, uh, you know, major is the, probably the most usable and most common scale. Um, not probably. It is. Unless you're playing metal, in which case you're probably more likely to play in a minor key. But all other styles, major keys are very, very, very common. Although, <laughs> I'm con contradicting myself again, Spanish music, a lot of flamenco music's all in minor keys, major keys sometimes, but mostly minor keys. And I'm going to sneeze here. Um, so, uh, but I, I, you know, there's some tricks I can show you just to, to have fun with these scales, uh, to help you learn them, but also just to kind of do, make some, you know, if you play the scale straight G major, it sounds very, very diatonic, right? It sounds very in pocket. diatonic sound. One little trick, it's pretty pretty easy to do, is, uh, and, and this works better with reapers than it does with e-scales, but we can at least do the bottom four strings, these four strings down here, okay, the sixth, the fifth, and the fourth, and the third, and just play the bottom two notes of, on each string, or the top two notes, but start with the bottom two notes, you get this F sharp, the G, the C, uh, B, C, the E, and the F sharp, and the, the A, and the B. It just sounds like, it doesn't sound like a G major scale, but you're totally in the key of G major. And you can continue if you want. But 
and I'm just thinking because you, we only have two notes on the um, on the B string, so we can kind of stop at the at the B string. <laughs> Over that progression, it definitely sounds like you're playing some weird, like, modal jazz thing, but it's just... You could kind of do the same thing you if you want you could take the uh and i'm waiting till we get up a few more viewers but uh this is still within uh shoot gosh i'm having a hard time today getting my windows in order um uh, this is still um it diatonic it's still lessons on this scale it helps you learn it actually um I, you know you're learning it in weird chunks but you're learning it uh but you can do the same thing with the neck the top two strings of, of the it doesn't sound as weird as this but basically I'm just playing in that in that uh, diagram over here at the top one well both of them doesn't matter and again the, the blue note and the top one is are, are all the roots those are G notes down here I'm highlighting the blue notes highlight the um, uh, the G shape or I mean the E form shape of the G chord, okay? Because I want you to be able to see this scale wrapped around, and I want you to see all of the scales wrapped around the caged method shapes. And in the caged method, uh, C, A, G, E, D, this is basically wrapped around the E shape, okay? Here's your E shape, like your famous E chord. <laughs> like I said, I got to work on my metal. <laughs> I got it. I got it because I got another thing coming next week that's more more of the same, and I'm like, I'll leave. It's just weird. I had a whole run of like oud. I was playing oud on three different things almost simultaneously. And then I get these metal calls, and it's like, okay, well, sure. You know, and they, and they could call a metal player, but most metal players can't read music, so it puts them at a disadvantage. Um, and um, I already have, you know, this business is so much about relationships. I think every business is about relationships. Uh, I mean, if you own your own business and you um, have a vendor that you're working with, if they're not decent people, you're going to probably try to find another vendor. So uh, that's the same thing true in the music business. Um, but yeah, you can take the top two strings or top two notes of each of the string sets because we have on the bottom four strings, we have three notes per string, almost a three per. Um, and oops. You can do the, if you did the top pairs of strings on each, or top pair of notes on each string, you would end up with this sound. Which is kind of cool too. It sounds, and, and you can, and the nice thing about this is you could technically keep going, okay? You can, okay, so over the jam, strings too in conjunction with that. Alright, so let me, I'm going to 
tune again real quick. A little off. And you could do that with any any diatonic scale, pentatonic. In, in other words, you're kind of playing a diatonic scale. You're fingering it like a pentatonic scale. One of the you know one of the things when we learn all these pentatonic scales, you get really good at playing two notes per string. You know. But then you get these diatonic scales, and you got two, and then three, and you know it just gets all jumbled. So to be able to turn it. Turn it into a uh, kind of a, a pseudo pentatonic thing as far as your right hand's concerned. Your right hand's sitting there going, oh, cool, we're playing pentatonics today. <laughs> your left hand's like, no, we're not. Um, and so, another thing you can do so, so there's those, the two, the bottom notes, okay? You can play the top two notes on each string. And if I were to play those, I would probably move my hand up. Just, just like I was doing. You can also play, you have a third option, you can play the outside notes. Which is just one, four, one, four, one, four, one, four, until you get to the, to the second string. And that also will sound very odd yet is 100% in the key. Combine those things so I can do it. Now I'm doing like the lower three or lower two, and then the outside two. David, <laughs> you guys, I can't, you cannot cannot tell you can play the scales. I <laughs> getting very you're getting very Scottish on me there, David. Let's see. Oh, hey, Whitson, Roger. Thanks for the comment on the video. So you guys saw the video, the jam track. And that's the one we're listening to right now. <laughs> you notice I put the tempo at 19, 119.5. That's my vain attempt to not get snagged for some kind of copyright infringement. Because a part of the thing I think about with my, um, when I did the bluegrass jam at 120 was that 120 is the most common tempo. Like when you turn on a metronome, it's usually set to 120. <clears throat> when you load a, uh, a new session on Logic, it's set to 120. So it's just, uh, in fact, 120, you can almost always find 120 without a metronome. You know how? I'm going to give you a little trick here. and I, it, We'll see I, see how close I am. Although we're just playing in 119. Uh, so it may not, it may be cheating. Um, but marching, uh, like marching bands love 120. So if you think of the song, da 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 you think of that tempo. That's pretty close to 120. Nope. Um, let's see here. Um, where's my metro? Here it is. So 
let's go. No, that's not it. Here it is. And I'm set to. Oh, stop telling me what's new. I don't care. Oh, I was fast. So if you think of marching band, though, that's that's a good tempo for a marching band. So you can kind of, I mean, I don't know. I, I bet there are people with perfect tempo. You know, you got people with perfect pitch. I wonder if there's people that could just, hey, uh, play, uh, you know, tap out 104, and they go, hmm, hmm, hit 104 right on the money. I, I don't know. That would be a weird skill to have. I don't know how useful it would be, but actually for a drummer, it would be phenomenally useful. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I got I got to work on my metal playing. Stupid sessions work. Um, so let's see. Now the the All right. So, sorry, getting emails for work stuff. Uh, now, um, so we were talking about um, the some of the chord tones, some of the plain scale tones. Uh, but what I want to do, let's play through the scale again. I'm going to change my tone so it's not so insane. Uh, maybe this one. A little loud. All right. Um, and what we want to do is just kind of play through the scale again. Okay. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll um, we'll play through the scale up and down, ascending and descending, and then we'll do the bottom two, the top two, and the outside two, and just for fun. Okay. It's just a way to kind of give you a different way to play through a scale, um, and it works on any scale. But to make it sound like it's not too too normal, or too inside. You can sound outside without it. It's tricks is what it is. Okay. Uh, where's uh, where's Avito? He's always looking for tricks. <laughs> he needs to be here. Okay, so let's start on the second finger on the third fret, playing the G note. G and an A with the pinky. Then B with the first finger on the second fret. Then C, then D, then E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, okay, G, F sharp, C, B, A, G, F sharp, E, D, C, B, A, and and G is the last note, okay? sharp would be the the uh, third of the five chord the D chord so it kind of gives you a little bit of a resolution all right so now let's just play the bottom two two notes we can do this on the bottom four strings pretty easily um, we're gonna go 
first finger on the second fret, and then third finger, or third fret, second fret, third fret, second fret, fourth fret, second fret, fourth fret. Four, two, four, two, three, two, three, two. It just sounds Middle Eastern or something. Okay, and if we want, we could continue up, maybe do something like this, go, do the, do the three and five, which would be the D and E, and then F sharp, G. So the drinking game, uh, uh, we have a drinking game here. Gary, you're here. Good morning, Gary. If I touch my face, if I refer to myself as a third person, if I use air quotes, if I say I played all the guitars on Apex Legend, which I did, uh, then um, you can take a sip. If I change guitars, you can take a sip. If I leave the room, you can take a sip. If I say there won't be a quiz on this, uh, you can take a sip. Or if I hold up my mug, and same thing. Uh, that would be a celebratory sip. If I drop my pick, it's a sip. If I drop a thumb pick, that's two sips. Uh, if I say I had a band in high school called, that's also a sip. Of wine, well, that's okay. Wine would be good. It's too early for wine right now. I got to get through my day. But Wits End, I think you're in Scotland, right? Wits End, sorry. I always think Wit Send, but it's Wits End. Um, I, I sat next to a man named Norman Stone on a flight. Uh, he's a Scotsman on a flight. Uh, let me look him up real quick because uh, on, on a flight when I was flying to uh, Louisville, he was flying to Louisville too because he was uh, going there to, I think, bail out someone that was in one of his documentaries out of jail. If I remember correctly, uh, but he was working on he uh, this Scottish lady invented this um, box that would help people get off of drug addiction, particularly heroin um, and opioids. Uh, in the seventies, I think she invented it, or in the sixties. And um, it's a fast. He's got a documentary out. I'll, I'll, I'll see. Uh, uh, shoot, what did I just say his name was? Uh, Stone, uh, what was his name? Dang it. I just said it. <laughs> My brain shut up. Norman Stone. There he is. Okay, Norman Stone. Uh, and you might know his wife, but he, he, uh, he's, he lives in a beautiful, he's a farm in northern Scotland. Norman Stone. He directed um, Shadowlands for BBC back in 86, which was not the... Uh, but his newest thing is The Final Fix. It's a documentary. I think you can get it on Amazon. Um, and it's about this box that can, they cannot get FDA approval for. It's ridiculous. And it's super cheap. It could get rid of opioid addiction. But, of course, all the companies are fighting that. Let's see. What's his? He's married to Sally Magnuson. She's like a Scottish newscaster or something. Uh, Scottish broadcaster and writer. BBC Radio 4, BBC Scotland. Anyway, I don't know if you know who she is. But he was a super interesting guy. And, of course, he's a huge fan of C.S. Lewis, and so am I. And so that was really fun because this guy was kind of a, uh, an aficionado on... Uh, yeah. Um, 
aficionado on um, uh, C.S. Lewis, which was really cool. Um, the um, uh, yes, the black box. It was also uh, I read uh, Keith Richards' biography, autobiography. I think it was. Uh, maybe it was a biography. I don't think it was an. It was too well written to be a biography. But autobiographies are never very well written. Um, it was a biography, and um, they went down to the Bahamas, I think, or down to the Caribbean, and they this doctor and I for, you know I forgot that it was a woman, but they would it was just wires that attached to him and immediately they would just like not crave it anymore. <laughs> it was like, what? And so they'd hang out in um, the Caribbean for like two weeks, uh, just sleeping, sunning, chilling and getting off of heroin. But the main reason they went down to do this, which, which was the thing that blew my mind on the whole matter was the only reason they did it was so they could get off heroin and be clean so that they could go and do heroin again. Because the only time you really get high on heroin, apparently, is the first time you do it. And after that, it's all just about feeling normal. Uh, so that was... Uh, hey, Dennis. Uh, so that was crazy to, to hear about that. So, you know, um, I remember reading that in the book. You, that was the reason they went down there, was so they could go do heroin again for the first time. So, um, okay. So if we take the bottom two, let's do this one again. Or the top two, let's go do this one again. So it's going to be three, five, three, five... Four, five, four, five, three, five, three, five. Okay. And if you take the outside, it's kind of cool. It's two, five, all the way down to here. So, right? And then you go three, five, and then you go two, five again. Okay. That's just, it just sounds. Just kind of sounds uh, odd. Um, and it's kind of a fun way to play around the diatonic scales. And you could do this with all of the diatonic scales that I'm going to show you. We may do that. Um, to, uh, Friday, I'll show you. Um, oh my garden is going to be here in a minute. Friday, I'll show you the um, uh, the uh, the A Dorian. We're going to do A Dorian, which is the next scale up. So G major, and then next note in the scale is A. And if we build a scale on A, going A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, it would be a, a Dorian scale. And uh, so we're going to learn that one. And again, these scales are completely movable. So if I wanted to play... Um, you know, in C major, then what I want to do is um, just move this scale up so that this note, this is our root. See, in that first first diagram over here, the top one, um, it's the blue notes are all roots. Those are all Gs, okay? And so if I take that and move it to C, I've got a C major scale. Uh, and I can do those... C, I would be doing the kind of the same thing in the key of C. So th that's the great thing about the scale is you're learning 12 scales when you learn a scale that doesn't use open strings. Does that make sense? King Beer, what's going on? Are you new here? I don't recognize your handle, but maybe maybe I just did. I've just forgotten or you've changed it. Good to see ya. Um, so. Uh, some other, so scales, exercises, use the scale, you know, the, um, 
So basically I'm going G to B, and then A to C, and then B to D, and then C to E. And it's almost easier to see on the, the, the diagram up here, up, over here, uh, not the diagram, but the list of notes there. So I was, if I played every other note, it's G, B, A, C, B, D, C, E, D, F sharp, E, G, F sharp, A, and so on and so forth. It's a bit of a kind of a finger twister, you know. You know what a tongue twister is. It's... Backwards is even more difficult. But that's a, a, a way that you can get familiar with a scale using kind of an every other exercise. You can do groups of three. Uh. groups of three um, and groups of four is going to be more difficult because you're going to have to lay down your finger um, with uh, on some on some transitions from the highest note to the next lowest note you know create um, triads so you could go so I'm going G B D and then go to the next note a and that's going to be a hard transition because you got the D here and then the A's here a C E B D F sharp C E G D F sharp a E G B F sharp a C B D F sharp B C of um, exercises you can do. Uh, I, that's four right there. Um, every other. Triads. Groups of three. Four. And you could do four and five, too. Um, five, let's see, I don't know. Five I like to do with pentatonics. We talked about that before. Five on. You got a lot of you got a lot of times where you gotta you gotta get a note here and then and then roll. Um, that's a technique too that is is uh, probably I picked up in classical guitar. But basically, if I'm gonna play this C and this then this G, a lot of times what you do is you play the C. Instead of playing the C, because if you know it's coming, okay, and that's with classical guitar, you're, you're reading music. And generally what you're doing is you're memorizing pieces. Um, so, for example, if I were to pull out um, some Bach here, you know, for example, this, you can see there's, there are, there's lots of notation. There's right hand, which is the I am stuff, okay? There's slurs, there's the numbers, which is which is referring to your left hand. The circled numbers refer to strings where a note wouldn't normally be. So like that very, very first note of this fugue is an E note, but it's not played open E. It's played on the second string, I believe. Is that right? No, third string. So they don't want you to play 
this E, and they don't want you to play this E, they want you to play this E. Okay, so when um, when you're learning classical guitar, you, you pretty much are mapping out the best way to play every note, and, uh, and it's a setup thing. Um, so, for example, if I'm playing a piece and it's going to go like that, uh, I'm going to go G, A, B, C, and to G, then... Um, you would, instead of playing that C note with the tip of your finger, because your next note's going to be there, you need your tip for that, you would actually go, you would lay your third finger or pinky down and play that note flat and then roll your finger and get that note below it like this. So that's a technique that um, will come in real handy when you're doing something like a group of five on this scale. I've got that note and then I gotta go get this note. Same thing there. So I'm laying my first finger down. And so eventually what you do is you program that into the pattern. You program that, you, you, you program the using the side of your, or the flat of your finger rather than the tip of your finger for those notes that you're gonna go, you know that you're gonna go back on. And that takes a bit of, that takes a bit of practice and a little bit of discipline as well, so. Uh, uh, Dennis, that's the way you play. I mean, that, even that little exercise there, you can go A, second fret on the third string, to the to the um, fourth fret of the third string, and then roll and get that F sharp. See, I'm using the tip of my first finger, but I'm using the flat of my third finger, and then I'm rolling it up like that. It's called, it's called a roll, actually to do without with my fingers being in the way. And now I'm on the tip. It almost feels like my elbow is involved for some reason, you know? It's like... like <laughs> it, oh, classical guitar. Yeah, exactly. And that's a very common uh, tool in classical guitar, like I said, usually when you're wor working on a piece, you're memorizing it. And all that notation, uh, all that extra notation would be a lot to have to sight read. Those the fingerings, the right hand stuff, all that stuff. It's not there for sight reading. It's, it's there for you to get it the, the best, most efficient way. I mean, that was the whole thing about the Segovia scales. Like Segovia's G scale was this. He found the most efficient ways to play each of the scales, uh, the major and harmonic minor scales, uh, or no, melodic minor. He did melodic minor. Um, he found the most efficient way to play each of them uh, on the guitar to play three octaves. See, we're only doing two octaves. And he, would, he, did, he figured out a way with shifts. get three octaves. Do I use that very often in, in jazz or in rock or just in daily playing the SCOBY scales? Not really. For some reason it's kind of one of the, I mean, I mean, I know all those shapes, but I don't know that I've ever done that um, in a rock or jazz context. Um, so that's, but it's a good act, it's a good skill uh, to, to be able to do those scales that way. The harmonic minor, so no melodic minor. Uh, just a, a sidebar here. Uh, no, there won't be a quiz on this. Yay! I've reached eighty-three thousand subscribers. Man, I want to get to that hundred thousand. It's taking forever. Man, I was cruising there for a minute, and then it, and then it just, it just died. So I, it says I'm getting 900 or so every 28 days. So that tells me it's going to take about 17 months for me to get to, to get to, uh, so that's another year and a half before I get to 100,000. Unless I have some video that just explodes. I doubt my jam track that I dropped yesterday would. So I did, I, if you didn't see it, 
Um, it's my latest video. I dropped the, the I did, a, 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 I think it's 11 minutes long, that jam track. Yeah, it's 119.5 beats per minute. I haven't gotten any comments on it. I actually put in the, in the info, as I said why I did that, but I'm trying to avoid the bots. <clears throat> um, so, uh, the copyright bots. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, the harmonic minor. Okay, so like A harmonic minor, I'm sorry, melodic minor. Melodic minor, it's interesting, okay? So when it's, when you go, uh, A minor is normally A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, okay? Okay, so harmonic, mel, uh, mel, uh, sorry, just regular minor is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, okay? Harmonic minor is, uh, did that wrong, is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sharp, A. So you got, you've got a minor third there between F and G. You got a minor third, so it's not a, but it sounds like this. And that's the same ascending as descending. I subscribe to you, Gary. I think monetization happens at a thousand. Um, back when I started YouTube, you didn't have to have, any, you could monetize from day one. Uh, now it's, I think it's a thousand subscribers and 10,000 views. If you have a thousand subscribers, you're probably not going to have a problem getting 10,000 views. Um, or it's, it may not be, yeah, I think it's 10,000 views, something like that. Okay. So, so, it, and then melodic minor is weird because what it is is it's you raise the sixth and the seventh. So instead of F, you play F sharp, and instead of G, you play G sharp. But then descending, you put them back to normal. That's the scale. I think it's for composer composers, like if you wanted to be able to... justify certain chords I'm not sure but um, so that would be a B C D E F sharp G sharp a G F E D C B A so a B C D E F sharp G sharp a G F D E C B A like thus and that would be what's called melodic minor. Okay, so that's what, so when Segovia did, um, when Segovia did the, the minor scales, and, and uh, uh, Dennis, you know this, he, he did ascending, he did harmonic. I mean, sorry, melodic, the sharp, the race, sixth and seventh. See, I got stopped in the middle. Yeah. So that's with a, a, an F sharp and a G sharp going up, and then an F natural and a G natural coming down. It has a very leading sound. comment uh, Rick on the video
F sharp. No, just, I, in fact, it's all major triads. Pretty simple stuff. Um, so next, uh, so let's see, Friday we'll learn the, uh, the A Dorian scale. And um, those will be, um, and then we'll probably do one scale per day. So we'll, I'm spending two, two days on the major because it's, it's just, a, you know, it's the most common scale, the major scale. So uh, let me do a little more playing here. Here's that loop that I've dropped up. So you, if you want this loop, it's, I put it up on my YouTube channel and I did made it last for 11 minutes. So that's plenty of time uh, to jam and practice. And I put no ads in it except at the beginning and the end, okay? So here's what... Yeah, I, I made sure the drums were changing every like eight bars, and then that I think I did. A, I think the eight, 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 eight. It's a thirty-two bar phrase where the drums kind of keep changing. So, but it's a thirty-two bar loop. The drums are. So if you listen for thirty-two bars, you'll hear the same drums over and over again. And I did slight changes on the bass and the keyboard, but not very much. It's pretty subtle. You know what, here, you know, you can, well, what I often will do, sorry, I got to get to my, where am I, there am I, okay, where am I, there am I, <laughs> uh, when I'm writing, um, 
you know, pop hooks and things like that, I, I just get the tape rolling and leave it rolling. And invariably I'll come up with something like, oh, wait, wait, what, what did I do? And I'm like developing it or whatever. I keep, you know, trying to make it like figure out exactly where the best, you know, the best lick could be, the best hook could be. And, um, and then I'll go back uh, and, and find it if I, you know, can't remember it. Usually once I hit on it, like when I'm writing hooks, usually when I hit on it, I just, I, I will um, uh, know it and then I will refine it and get it down and then make it feel, it's got to feel good. It can't just be like, oh, this perfect. got to have some vibe to it as well as being a cool idea don't think play exactly but if you're not thinking and you're playing you'll come up with something and you won't be able to replicate it and so that's why I like to record myself um, and you could do that with your phone um, you could play my jam track and record it or you could go to a, a I hate to say it on YouTube <laughs> and get the flag my <laughs> flag my video but you can go to a like a, a, a you know YouTube to mp3 site and download that file uh, kind of why I didn't do that, though, put it up on the Discord. Oh, by the way, I'll, I'll post the Discord link. Uh, just because I'd rather, you know, make some money off of it. <laughs> Is that so wrong? <laughs> you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go to the trouble to upload, you know, do it, bounce it, upload it, whatever. You know, it didn't take me very long. Obviously, it's not a major chore to do one of those videos. I could do a bunch of those, but I would hate to. And I may do more as we do more lessons. I may do more. Uh, like that, but I wouldn't want to do like drop 10 in a row because then I would have all these people unsubscribe because they're like, dang it, why am I getting so many notifications from Tom? So here's the Discord link. A lot of people are talking about gear here, uh, uh, guitar repair, luthier stuff. Um, yes. I, I agree 100%. Uh, uh, the E minor um, C, G, D is uh, the most common um, progression in pop right now. Um, of course, in the 50s, it was G, E minor, C, D. Um, it was, you know, you can take a sip. Zero viewers right now, according to YouTube. Um, and so, yeah, that was in the 50s. Um, and then um, the, this... was also very common in the 90s. other ones um, I'll see. four one five six it was fairly common there for a while uh, the one I was just playing actually is a pop song that I wrote called home to mama and that one is uh, technically one six five four so i kind of reverse the the uh the 50s progression instead of going you know actually almost like that better <laughs> but hey it inspired sam to write a really good hook so uh so that actually i think that is by far uh cody simpson's number one song i think it's got 150 million spins on spotify alone And um, yeah, this one six four five is definitely the oldies progression. Uh, but you know, there are songs uh, today. I think Ed Sheeran's got a couple songs that use that progression. Um, 
Uh, he got in trouble for using the... the which is ridiculous. You can't copyright the chord progression. That's one, three, four, five. Uh, but also you can take one, uh, first conversion, one chord, four, five. But well, we talked about this before on chord progressions. Um, Tom's magic. I just I played a nice riff. So let's see what else. What else is going on? Uh, oh, it dropped down to zero again. What is going on with YouTube? Uh, Gary, you play a few uh, uh, mandolin orange. Oh, a few from mandolin orange. I don't know that. A G D. That's the chord progression. A, A, and then G C A. Is that a chord progression or is that a, those are keys, Denise? Um, Prime, Clark, Fully, or oh, Steve Earle's great too. I love Steve Earle. One of my favorite songwriters. Was he the one that was married to Mandy? Uh, is it Mandy? More, the actress, Steve Earle. I, that didn't go well, because <laughs> I think he's, wasn't he in prison or something? I don't know. Uh, he, he uh, oh, wait, spouses. No, who was it? No, it wasn't him. Who was it that was married to her? Oh, yeah, he's a good son, right, too. Uh, uh, Mandy Moore, yeah. Mandy Moore, she's a great singer. Uh... Let's see, where are you? IMDb, there we are. Ryan Adams, that's right. Ryan Adams is a very good songwriter, but I think very difficult person to be married to. Uh, but they did do a record that was really good. Amanda Lee, a very good record. I, and I think Amanda Lee is actually her first name and middle name um, and uh, yeah it's a very good record um, I guess I, I was under the impression that that uh, Ryan wrote with her on it but no in fact was he even involved it's interesting Mandolin Orange. I'll have to check them out. Yeah, husband and wife duos. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, Richard and Linda Thompson's record and their whole album, which is a great record, was a, was about their divorce. <laughs> was it Shoot Out the Lights, I think is the name of the album. Man, does that, that record has some good songs on it. And, and, and Richard Thompson's an amazing guitar player. One of those, you know, under the radar kind of guys. He's not a shredder necessarily, but boy, does he play some interesting stuff and a lot of emotion in his playing. I mean, just an immense amount of emotion in his playing. Unlike me, I'm, I'm cold and sterile. <laughs> so, oh, where's my chord? There it is. All right. So back to, I can cha I change the guitar so you can take another sip. And uh, I don't see, I still don't see, uh, what's his name? Acu, Acutones. Because um, I did kind of, work, I did listen to a little bit of sweet music by Ro Roadmaster. But if he shows up, I'll, I'll go, okay, here's some chords from it. It's not, it changes keys a lot, you know. talk about it uh, <laughs> without him here. So. Uh, 
um, one thing we can look at too is different shapes that are in the 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 uh, G major scale. There, this is a, an E minor shape I really like a lot. There, I love that E minor shape, and all it is is the top three strings, right? It's the same notes as G B E, but they're right here. So five four five. I love this minor shape. If you got a bass player and he's playing E, you don't need to have a bass E in the bass. And the great thing about this voicing is that you can you can give it a little squeeze and give it some vibrato. Um, see, I'm just you play with you play with those fingers too. You can slide into it. Almost sounds Hawaiian. Is here. So it'll force you to learn the notes on your second string if you want to be able to find this chord. Um, so this, if that's an E, then this is E minor. And then the other minor chords in the key of G major are A minor and B minor, so that's all I'm doing. Sliding up to A, up to B minor, back down to A minor. Now it really sounds Hawaiian. <laughs> can't play it or else I'll get a copyright thing. Um, and that's just open six string and then ten nine ten nine eight seven. If you want to hit the open E string you can. Yeah, so, and then, of course, there's a C chord right here, right? So it's part of this bar chord. Okay, and then the G chord right there, five, four, this is all on the third string. In fact, let's stick with these three strings for a second. The, the fourth string, the third string, and the second string. This is our G, so it's five, four, three. D chord is here, four, two, and three. One thing, you can go below. Um, I'm just basically taking the middle note down to the next note. Each one of those, you take that middle that middle note and go down to the next scale tone, and you get some nice voicings that way too. So let me play the chord progression so you can see. Uh, okay. D. 
vein for your fence hose. Go to the top note. down, going down uh, to the, down one scale tone in the top note. Blues lick works great on the E minor. Great work works great on C. Works great on the G. Doesn't work so good on the uh, the D chord. But if you, go, if you just stay on the A, it's not bad. I'm really trying hard to stay within that scale that's up there on the screen uh, over here, both those scales. And again, just to, just to tell you what's going on in those scales, 
the uh, the notes are all in the key of the of G major diatonic. Every single note that's written there, starting on the second fret. Okay, that you see the second up there. So all those notes are in the key of G. Okay, the uh, top diagram is uh, the G major scale, and the the blue notes are the G's. So if you wanted to play G to G, if you want to make it sound like a G major scale, play from the blue note to the blue note, and then from this. And those are all G's. Okay, uh, the white notes there are the notes that are, that are outside of the that are below or above the final notes of the scale. So if I were to play G scale and go to there, I still have another note that's in position that I can grab, and that's an A. And I was just using it, so it's a totally legitimate note you can use. And it's one you don't want to ignore necessarily. It gives you another high note to play. To play. So, and then this one down here is also uh, you don't want to ignore it. If I'm playing down, you can kind of think of it as a leading tone to the to the tonic. That F sharp is a strong leading tone. Okay. Now, um, uh, the next diagram, okay, below that, right here, that one has six blue dots. It's this, the white dots are the same. But the blue dots, those six blue dots, were, are showing you where this G bar chord is, which is the E form chord, okay? And I'm trying to show you where how this scale fits around the E form when we're talking about caged. And again, just to remind you what caged, if you don't know what the caged method is, it's C-A-G-E-D, caged, the word caged, like a caged bird. And it's the order of chords as they appear up your up your fretboard. So if we're in the key of C, C here's a C chord. So you know the the shape C A G E and D. Those are your, that's why it's called cage. It's using those five shapes. And the next shape after C is the A shape. The next shape after A is the G shape. And there's the G right there. Next shape after G is the E shape. And there's your E shape right there. And the next shape is the D shape. And there's your D. And then the next one is C, again, full circle. Uh, we're, but we're in the key of G, so the G shape is the first one. So after G in the word uh, case is E, so E is the next shape. D will be in the next shape after that, C is the one after that, and A is the one after that, and so on and so forth. Okay. What happens is you start to see these shapes up and down, and the, learning the scales around those shapes will actually, um, uh, will actually speed up your ability to start to see the... the um, the caged method or the caged shapes up and down the neck, but also learning the caged method or the caged shapes up and down your neck will also speed up um, your ability to learn where certain scales lie. Okay, and um, so um, viewers love the noodles. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so you know. It, as far as soloing, you know, what, how to use the scale, like I was just saying there, it just depends on the style of music. You know, obviously, if I was doing metal, it would be very, very different. Um, I might <laughs> go, you know, I don't know. You know, you would do something, or you might, might use those, those weird fragments of the, of the diatonic scale. Uh, if I was doing, um, if I was doing like a folk, not a folk thing, but if I was doing like an alt folk or a, I don't know, I, I really like the, I like the, 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 the pedal steel licks, the hammer-ons. So that's basically, you know, it just depends on the style of music you're playing. If I'm playing jazz, obviously I'm going to, you know, I'm going to spend more time on sevenths, ninths, uh, you know, sixth, things like that. I don't know. It's just, it just, just, just depends on, again, the style. So, okay. Uh, oh, good. What's in? I'm glad.
Uh, yes, uh, which uh, uh, Dennis, I often recommend uh, to beginners if they're having a hard time doing, if they need to do bar chords, they're having a hard time doing it. You can always tune your guitar down a half step and put a capo on the first fret. So now you're still in standard. The only thing is your fret markers won't line up. But um, how? But what that does is it, it does two things. It loosens the strings so they're a little bit easier to push down, right? If they're looser, they're going to be flimsier. Um, and then it also puts the strings at fret height. So you're not fighting the nut, which is going to be above the fret height. If you're particularly on the F chord, you're really fighting the nut. Um, bar chords are easier on electric than acoustic, um, but ultimately you should be able to play them on any guitar. It's just a matter of finding the the uh, ergonomics that works best for you. And a lot of people, it's um, you know the, where your elbow is, where your back is, where your shoulder, you know that kind of stuff. And then your thumb is important to keep the thumb back. But, I, you know, I, I don't do bar chords with my thumb up here. It's just almost impossible. Um, I always use this example. If you look at your hand, and um, if you, uh, this is particularly important for stretch chords, but if you close your hand into a fist like this, you'll notice that your fingers all want to kind of go to the center of your palm. Like if each finger could go where they wanted to go, they would probably all go right to the middle of your palm. And yet they kind of fight each other, and then they, they go like this. So if, if the... If the palm of the if the guitar is in the palm of your hand, then you have very limited mobility. You can't really do a whole lot. But if if the the palm of your hand is down here and your thumb is back here, then you've got a lot more stretch. See, I can stretch and play, you know. Right? Um, but if I bring my thumb around, I can't, it's not gonna happen. If I if I have the neck in the palm of my hand. So that's another key element to playing bars. Uh, of course, the other thing is keep you keep it up against the fret. Let the fret do most of the work. You don't need to push the string all the way down to the wood. You only need to push the string down to the fret. Okay, um, and I I fail at that miserably because I'm always push pushing way too hard. Uh, but jazz and metal players typically have very very light, well even bluegrass players tend to have very very light touch. Uh, someone was <coughs> oh it was um, I was I was watching. Uh, Tim Pierce's um, Tim Pierce's uh, video on Eddie Van Halen, and he um, he uh, was talking about just a couple days ago because when Eddie died, um, everybody's doing these tributes. Uh, yeah, I think neck neck width matters a little bit too. Yeah, I mean the the wider the neck, the harder a capo is going to be. I mean, harder a a bar is going to be. Um, but he was talking about, he saw Eddie back in like 76, I think, playing at Gazzari's on, on Sunset. And, uh, or maybe, Gazzari's was on Hollywood or was it on Sunset? I think it was, I think it was on Sunset Boulevard. And um, uh, he said he walked by and he heard it and he, he could not go in. He was visiting LA. He goes, oh, that guitar sounds so amazing. Um, and so he went in and watched this guy, Eddie, play his whole set and, uh, they were doing like top 40 at the time or, or covers. Um, and uh, he said he was amazed at how light his touch was. His, both his right hand and left hand were very light on the neck. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's true. Most of the, so many players um, play very, very light. And I think when you, the lighter you play, the faster you can play. The lighter your touch, because if you're, you know, it's, think about you digging yourself a hole. If you dig yourself a five foot hole, you got to climb yourself out of it. If you only dig a one foot hole, you got to step. You can step yourself out of it, and that's kind of what's happening um, with with playing. If you're digging really deep, whether it be in, with your pick or with your um, with your fretting hand, uh, whatever you dig into, you're going to have to dig out of. And um, and so that was kind of a, a common thing um, among a lot of fa really fast players or just really amazing guitar players. I remember producing this girl. Well, she and I were writing songs together, and I was always amazed by her voice. And I, I worked with her. I played on some recordings of hers and stuff like that through another producer. And I finally had her in the studio, and I got her singing, and um, uh, I got her singing, and she, um, I, I realized she could do anything. Trills were like, she had, you know, it's like she could the things I could play. <laughs> You know, she wouldn't have a problem, you know. I mean, she could sing that. 
you know, like a bird. And uh, I'm like, dang, girl. And I realized when I was then mixing the vocals, how quiet she was singing. She barely was, I mean, she was right on that microphone and she was barely, it was so quiet, but it was like, push just enough air out to get those notes in it. I was like, oh, see, because I would be belty. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> So, uh, uh, Wit is asking me what kind of strings. Uh, I, you know, pretty much. No, no, it's it's not. But that's not that common of a question, actually. Wit's end. Um, uh, pretty much every guitar, except like my Squire Pop guitar, uh, are all ten tens to forty six. Uh, Elixir uh, lights, um, and then the, the Squire is like nine to 42. So that's extra lights. Um, I'm actually going to probably bump up to mediums for maybe the, the Gibson. So I can do a drop D for some metal stuff. I think it'll work better for metal. Um, I was just watching a video where a guy was actually going to C standard, uh, D standard, C standard. And all that means is that they're dropping everything down a whole step or that would be D standard. E standard is what we tend to play in. D standard would be D down a whole step. C standard would be D uh, D down a whole step, so down two whole steps from E. And then he put the heaviest strings on and played B flat standard. So basically a half step lower, oh, I don't have my baritone in here, half step lower than my baritone. And um, that was pretty crazy. Um, uh, um, yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. To, to see him play that low and it was really tight sounding. Uh, but I did notice that like when he played with tens, uh, he didn't even use nines. He, tens were starting point, so 10 to 46. Uh, when he went to D, it was a little bit not tight. And then when he went to C, it was, he, could, he couldn't keep that C note in tune. He couldn't keep the strings in tune. Everything was bending kind of weird, pitch sharp mostly. Because uh, because then if you put the slightest bit of pressure on the string, you're like bending it like, you know, it just, it just goes crazy. Um, I actually have that problem with my baritone. Um, I need to get a wound string for the second string, the second string from the bottom. Because it's right now it's an unwound string and it's just too pitchy. Um, but the problem is I, I grabbed a wound string that would have been the right um, gauge, but the length of it wouldn't reach the... I couldn't get it to the to the winder because a baritone has a longer neck. It's like a bass neck. So I have to go and find a string, uh, a wound string of that gauge, which was like, I don't know, 20 or something that will reach. It's, I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. It's <laughs> like, dang it. I was hoping to fix that problem in like a, in a minute. And I just realized, oh, I got to go find a Where am I going to find a, a wound string that is that long? You know, I guess it's taking off a bass or something. But... Yeah, and this scale will work over any style of music too. A major, it's a major scale. Uh, okay, so let's see. Question. Let's see. Ice coffee. I found that after many months of pain, the muscles must have just built up in my fingers and hand, and everything felt. Yes, you're definitely your hands will get stronger. I think, especially if you're playing every day. Uh, I, arr, I'd make a great pirate. Yes. <laughs> uh, have you uh, have you heard about the new pirate movie? It's rated R. Go, go, Google pirate pickup lines. They're pretty funny. Like, R, prepare to be boarded. <laughs> but Google get, pirate pickup lines. They're pretty dang funny. Uh, they're perfect for talk like a pirate day, which just happened like back in September, I think. Uh, worked my lead. Learn, uh, I also said I worked on my lead and learning a bunch of different style songs on acoustic and things just got easier over time. Exactly. Uh, yeah, there is no silver bullet, unfortunately, unless <laughs> the, the only silver bullet, bullet is to pay someone else to play it for you. <laughs> ah, bad. Is that one age appropriate? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what are you saying? What do you think I said? I'm just saying, get ready to get on the ship. That's what I said. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Ed, it took you nine months to get that. Isn't that ironic that you, you find out that you're pushing too hard? Yeah, a lot of times when you when you overexert yourself, you're 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 take, putting all the energy into one finger and taking it from the others, and you might be able to get the bar down. And what I would tell people is go ahead and practice the bar without fingers on it. I mean, you could start with like your second finger on it, like that, but eventually you're gonna have to be able to do the bar without it. I always give the example like playing the A bar chord here. If we play that A bar chord, we have three notes that are depending on the bar and three notes that are depending on three other fingers, okay? So the one, first finger is, is responsible for three notes. We play A minor, now we've got four notes dependent on the, on the bar, and if we play A minor seven, we have five notes depending on the bar, but see, once we take off our second finger, we can use it as a, an assistant to the first finger. So, you know, F, F minor seven might be one of the harder bar chords to play because you have five notes that are dependent on the actual first finger. So, and I can do it without the help of the, of the second finger, but, but if you're not, if the second finger is not doing anything, why not, right? the easiest bar chord for your fingers then? Uh, I mean, one thing you could do is you could practice playing just the top three strings like this. That's a nice little A minor like there. And then you could get one more string going and one more and then one more. You could, you could work your way up. Um, but with the F chord, I'm assuming you're having trouble playing just the, bar, the F bar chord, which is I would say B flat's harder than F because you've got to put a, a fret between the first finger and the second finger. So on top of having to have the spread, you are also having to put down a bar. The only advantage is that you have two notes only, the fifth string and the first string, that are dependent on the the bar. Um, and uh, but the other downside is that you really are probably going to need to mute the sixth string. So not only is you're asking your first finger to bar and get the first and fifth string, you're asking it to mute the fifth string or sixth string. And that that makes that one harder. And it gets easier as you go up the neck and to a point. And then for me, it starts getting harder because my hands are getting squeezed in there and I can't play it. Uh, uh, but, you know, probably a lot of people like the minor seventh bar chord, like this D minor seventh. So that would be, uh, I could... You know, a minor seventh one, but this is just an example of one. D minor, oops, D minor seven, the X five, seven, five, six, five, like that. And so you really, you do have three notes that depend on the bar uh, on your first finger, but um, it's just a little easier the further up you get. It's a little bit more in line with your body. Um, like your arm's not ex reaching out up here. That's part of the problem too, is if your arm's here. That's why sometimes with classical guitar, it's a little easier because your, your, your arm is a little bit more in line with that, you know? Um, but when you're playing like this, you gotta, it almost feels like you're reaching way over here to get it. Uh, so when you play a chord up the neck a little bit more, it's a little bit easier to play bar chords there. And then, um, I don't know, I, a lot of people, it's, Hendrixy kind of thing to do. Of course, Lenny, Lenny Bro, and people like that too. You know. Which end? I remember 40 years ago, you mean before you were born, um, my drummer was trying to learn the guitar and I said, just press enough to make the notes and he was delighted. 
He was used to bashing. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing true with drums, though. You don't need the stick to go through the drum head and into hit the bottom head. You know, a lot of drummers, the you know, the fast drummers, they have a very light touch. You, you, there's no way you can play fast and be like pounding. Um, Yeah, it's uh, Bruce is saying, I have a number of instructional books. I'm amazed at how they never talk about developing fingertip calluses. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't even have calluses anymore. My skin just kind of grows in a little tougher. Uh, so I don't have, ever have, I, you know, pain issues. Sometimes I do. I would, well, when I get called to do a lot of bass on a, on a session, uh, I'll get blisters right here. And I'll be like, dang it, you know, because <laughs> uh, I just don't play enough bass. Um there was something I got a blister from doing. Well, it's like playing for you know, play frisbee, and you get that, you get that blister right here. It's like, ah, dang it, it hurts so bad. You know, you're going out to the beach and you throw the frisbee for like an hour, and the next day you've got this horrible blister inside your finger because you, because you don't play frisbee every day. So, okay, yeah, it was '64. Well, you're a kid. <laughs> I was born in '61. Uh, Rick said, "What now?" Some people's fingers are double jointed. I think mine are one and a half jointed <laughs> or one half jointed. Um, yeah, I. Uh, yeah, what was the thing? I, I used to do this, you know, where you would. Your fingers would be limp if you bend them like this. I had like a piano. I don't know if that, that doesn't have anything. My thumb actually goes, both thumbs go out of joint. But that doesn't come into play ever in guitar. So. Um, some people will, they can bend this finger back like that. We talked about this the other day where there's a bunch of different ways to play A chord. And some people will pay, play it like that with their first finger. Because that's just about the exact length. Here's another trick for playing bar chords, uh, uh, Dennis. Is you really can't bend this finger. You, you're going to have to keep this finger straight. So if you're bending at this joint, this probably is not long enough to cover six strings. I'm sorry, this is probably not long enough to cover six strings. I mean, it's not, even on a, on a narrow neck. So you're going to have to keep the, the, um, that joint bent. And if you, if you bring, like I said, if you bring the neck of the guitar in the palm of your hand, you're definitely going to be bending that joint. Um, if, you, you know, if your thumb comes around too much, you're going to be bending that joint. So. Wrist low, yeah. Keep your wrist down here, exactly. When I was playing, um, uh, when I was playing classical guitar, my I was I was constantly collapsing my wrist like this, and my teacher would grab my wrist and you know, I'd be trying, you know, be doing doing my Segovia scales, and he'd be looking at my wrist and he'd go boop. So I, he he really did train me. Really nice having a teacher that, that, that would just give you grief. Uh, at least he didn't whack my wrist with a, a ruler or something like that. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a nunnery. <laughs> it wasn't a Catholic school. Uh, let's see. I, I think actually Butler was probably at one point a Presbyterian seminary. All universities started as seminaries. Now they don't even couldn't even spell the word. Um, well, yeah, also that's, that's key. And that was one of the things that I didn't mention in my seven tips for older beginners was uh, to get your guitar properly set up. Because a, a cheap guitar, is, I'm fine with a cheap guitar, but if, if, it's, if it's, the neck is all warped, it'll be impossible to play in tune and impossible to play, period. And it'll just be discouraging and frustrating, and you probably won't want to pick it up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, not that I would go and take an a $80 guitar and get a $60 setup or a $100 setup for it. Uh, you might be better off just spending, taking that 200 bucks and spending it on a little bit better guitar. Um, I Oh, see you, Jim Horse. Good to see you. Um, I one of, one of the things I really recommend if you're going to buy a guitar, if you're a beginner particularly, is to take some a guitar player with you. Maybe buy him once and say, hey, you want to go guitar shopping with me? Help me pick out a guitar. 
and you don't tell them your budget and then they'll they'll find a guitar in your budget um i just watched a video music is win with uh and then the, he had another he had the guy with the, the bass player really good uh, adam of neely adam neely and they were shopping for i think they were looking for a bass in the 500 hundred dollar range and i was amazed at how how impressed Adam was with almost every instrument he picked up. He found something really good about every instrument he picked up. Um, on electric instruments, there's a lot in there in the $500 range. On acoustic in instruments, not so much. Um, uh, they, uh, um, they definitely, um, uh, you know, acoustic instruments, it's, it's you, you gotta have quality wood, quality work, workmanship, uh, and that takes time and money. So, uh, yeah, I know Brett, my teacher Brett. He never took the ruler out on me, but he he did he did make fun. You know, he did really kind of grab my wrist and keep bringing it out, and it worked. Eventually, I got to the point where, man, I pick up a classical guitar and I I keep my wrist that way. I even do it with a lot of other techniques too. You know. Lot of finger style stuff i'll keep my i'll do a classical technique so charlie b what's up my accordion teacher a juilliard graduate uh used to grab my hand and lovingly mash my fingers under the correct notes ouch <laughs> uh i actually the funny part about that is that you <laughs> you played accordion actually i'm not laughing uh my friend joe de Blasi, who is not a member of the Wrecking Crew, but he was given his career by Tommy Tedesco, who is a member of the Wrecking Crew. You can watch that entire movie on YouTube, by the way. Uh, here it is. Uh, it's a documentary. It's about an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, they're commercials. I watched it the other day or something, and I don't, I don't remember there ever being a commercial. So, um, But if you haven't watched this movie... Uh, you should, and um, like I said, it's free. It says free with ads. One, one forty-one. No, there's an ad. Okay, so here it is. Who gives it a thumbs down? Really, seriously. Where are you guys? There you are. So there's a uh, check that out. But Tommy Tedesco, who's one of the main the main guitar player of the Wrecking Crew. He gave my friend uh, Joe de Blasi his career back in the probably early 80s, maybe late 70s is when Joe got started uh, working on TV and movie. Maybe it was more 70s. Uh, Tommy had seen Joe play at two weddings in two consecutive weekends. And the second time he was very impressed with his playing and he said, hey, come over to my house and I want to see if you can sight read. So Joe, I think, didn't go to sleep for like two days he just practiced his sight reading and he got over and Tommy threw a bunch of music in front of him and Joe killed it. Joe's a great sight reader and uh, he blows me away. I can just read anything. And um, and Tommy said, okay, come to this studio and from now on you'll be sitting next to me. I'm like, I, I, you know, I didn't even know Tommy had that power. You know, that's usually a contractor's job. But I guess there was somebody dropping out of the, you know, studio business, you know, one of the guitar players was dropping out. And so, um, Joe got in, started playing on a lot of movies. Well, Joe's father-in-law, his wife, her, her, uh, his father-in-law was a guy named Frank Morocco. Just passed away just a few years ago, and he um, was pretty much the number one call accordion player in L.A. And I think his secondary market money, um, which is residual income, so if you don't work the whole year, you'll still get your secondary market money. That's all for work you did in the past. I think he made about a quarter million every July 1st from all the stuff that he did. He was the accordion player on all the Godfather movies. If you heard accordion on TV or in the movies from the 60s into the into the 90s, into the 1000s, it was probably Frank. And you're probably thinking, well, how much accordion music is there? Well, you'd be shocked. <laughs> and especially if it's a high-profile movie um, like, like Godfather, which is probably airing somewhere... 24 7 in the world uh that money just will just keep rolling in um but uh yeah um and so so but that's what joe uh yeah joe's father-in-law and he like i heard some of the stuff that that frank did um like he could play bebop like charlie parker on the accordion and accompany himself 
Yeah. I'm not even, oh, here we go. Yeah. The left hand is playing the chords and the right hand is, it was unbelievable stuff. Um, you know, it's just like, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot of secondary market money. Um, I think I have two or three movies. I just did another TV show, uh, a new show called I Played On, so I will get some secondary money market from that. Hopefully, the show will run for years. It'll be 20 seasons, and I'll play on every season. Uh, it's called it's called Filthy Rich. It's on Fox, and I don't know if it's started yet. I've seen ads for it, but I haven't actually seen any episodes. Uh, but I played on like three episodes of that season one. Uh, but most of the work I do is non-union and uh, non-royalty based. The gaming thing is not generally royalty based. Um, but I did like Transformers, the last Transformers movie. I did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Um, I did a, uh, I've done a lot of sidelining, which is union. So I get money for those still. Um, what's that? Uh, buh, 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 buh. Just in time for the music or the movie recommend. Exactly. Well, you know, and the great thing about accordion, it probably gave you a lot of music theory knowledge that you're still using, whether you know it or not. Uh, what are you saying, Holly? Yes, indeed. I'm intrigued. Not ready to jump in quite yet. Have another course of taking plus Tom's thing and my new pedal come hopefully today. Brain tilt. <laughs> um, let's see. Played behind Myron Florin with 100 other kids at Pasadena Civic. Oh, interesting. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, the movie. <laughs> also, uh, yeah, so the sidelining things I did was like, I did Gangster Squad, um, which was a Ryan Gosling film. I also did Mob City, which was on, it was like a very short run TV show on uh, Showtime maybe. I think maybe I'll make 20 cents a year from that. Gangster Squad, I'll still make in the hundreds every year in secondary market money. Uh, there were a couple, I got, a couple times I got a couple thousand dollars from that, you know. Um, and then... Um, Ugly Betty was the first one I did, and that was, I think, 2008, and I still make money on that one. As long as the show's airing somewhere, uh, there's residual income to be had. And now with streaming, they upload these entire seasons, so now the streamers have to pay those. You know, Well, they pay the production company, and the production pay company pays the company that collects the money for us, and then they pay it to us after they take out their fee, and it ends up being you know just a little, sometimes decent money, sometimes just a little money. I have friends that they really depend on it because, but they've been playing, you know, in movies since the eighties. So they just got a ton of, a ton of uh, residuals. I'm sure there are players that are making a million a year from some of the stuff they've done. Um, I know Frank, like I said, I knew Frank was making something like a quarter million a year, but um, I bet you George Daring probably makes it half a million at least. Cause if you look at his and it's spelled D O E R I N G. If you look at his IMDb, it's like, holy crap, you played on that movie and that movie and that movie and that movie. He's on TV probably on 50 channels at one time, all the time, around the clock. Uh, so uh, it's it's cool though. I'm actually, I think I, I've, I've got a couple clients now that used to use George, or maybe I've had three or four clients that used to use George. They use me now. George either got too expensive or too busy. Um, and also, I think he's planning on retiring, so that could that could pay off for me. I don't know that I'm qualified to take his place, uh, you know, with people like, you know, because he does um, David uh, Newman, Thomas Newman. He does he works with those guys. He works with John Williams, um, a lot of just a lot of composers, um, and so a lot of the guys I work with are up and coming. So who knows? I may be working with the John Williams of the next decade. Um, right now, I may be. So, I, all my composers I work for are great. I love working with them. So, uh, Oh, good. Yep. No, I knew what you meant, Charlie. Oh, Filthy Rich on Netflix show, really? I thought it was a... Rich 
which was on Fox. If it's Netflix, I won't make anything. Which TV show? Yeah, Fox. Mondays 9. So they must be, I think, it's weird if they're advertising on, they're advertising on, uh, I'll have to check it out, though. Oh, TV ratings. Well, Filthy Rich stabilizes. Let's see. Point three rating. That's pretty awful. It's third, I mean, holding steady a demo after sweep week drop. Um, yeah, hard to tell. Hard to tell. Hopefully, it'll last. You know, one of the things that they need to do. I, both, two of my favorite sitcoms, and I'm a I'm a big sitcom fan, so I might like this show. I don't know. It may I may not. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it. Um, but two of my favorite sitcoms, Cheers and Seinfeld, both performed horribly on, and both were NBC, and both were probably the same ex, uh, chief executive of the, of the TV department. I think it was a classic example of them really, really believing in a show and thinking it would eventually find its audience. And in both of those, they became number one shows and have both of them made, you know, a billion dollars for their everybody involved. So, um, or more. Um, so I think a lot of times you, you've, particularly with a sitcom where it's not as expensive to make, um, if you're different, other shows may be more expensive. If the hour long dramas, it may take them, I don't know how long, a month to make one episode or something like that. I'm not sure how that works. You know, with people working overlapping, obviously they're working simultaneously on multiple episodes. Um, but, uh, I've, I've got a friend who, uh, wrote, um, Jeff, um, let's see, uh, I was talking to him cause I was fascinated about it. Cause you know, I, I'm, I like writing screenplays. I've written several screenplays, and I, I've been told I was told by the number one um, literary agent in LA. She told me to don't write feature films, write episodic TV. She said that's the future. Don't write, and I and she told it right now with the COVID thing. It's totally true. Um, was this Jeff? Uh, oh, Jeff Bell. That's right. So Jeff wrote, uh, producer, is this him? Yeah, he he was born in um, in, El, in Indianapolis. He actually went to one of my uh, my rival high school rivals. Uh, he executive producer, uh, wow, 136 episodes of Agents of Shield, but he was a writer mainly. Did wrote uh, 12 episodes of Shield. Uh, the Protector, he wrote his first thing where he wrote five episodes of the original X-Files uh, back in 99, 2001. Angel, Alias, Daybreak, those were things he wrote. And then producer job is a weird job, and, and so he um, he's done a lot of that. Harper's Island, uh, Spartacus, Protector, Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D., Slingshot. Uh, and so he, uh, he was saying, yeah, when he writes an episode, if they are producing the episode, he'll spend like a month with them while they film it. So that's part of the job is to, is to work. But that may, probably tells me he was also put down as producer um, uh, as well as writer for the episode. Um, but um, <clears throat> well, you've got, at least you've got one co-written co -written do you, is it was it was the movie made, David? Um, I've written five feature scripts, I think, complete, finished, front to back, um, and it is a chore. It's a major, major chore, but it's a lot of fun. I love it because you're creating worlds. You know, you're like God. You're creating histories. You're creating futures. You're creating characters. You're creating sometimes, in some cases, worlds. I've never done a, a sci-fi or a fantasy script, but uh, I've done various different types of scripts. Um, and, um, but any one of them, I could probably elongate, um, with a couple exceptions, any one of them I could elongate into a episodic, uh, series. 
Um, and so uh, that's what I've been told. And so I have created one series. I have another one that um, is, 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 was a feature idea that I started, and I'm trying to migrate it into a, a more of a episodic television kind of thing. Um, you can map it out. It's called, you put together a show Bible is what it's called. And you can put in the show Bible, you can put descriptions of all the characters. Uh, you can put down, uh, you know, things like, for example, uh, architecture, say, uh, if you're, um, filming, it's a period piece and you want it to take place in the sixties. Um, like I have one that takes place in 1970 in Los Angeles. And so I, I picked out a house that I thought would be perfect for the you know, one of the main characters' house. Uh, I found that. I found furniture for you know from the '60s uh, to use in the studio. Things like that. Equipment, even. Um, and then also you create backstories. Uh, you create you know story arcs for each, each character. The nice thing about episodic television is you can bounce around from character to character and taking their moving their story forward and forward and forward. So um, <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of where I was on this one. Um, and then the other, another one I was creating, uh, working on, it was uh, more of a, a kind of a thriller. Um, and uh, not, well, it was more of a uh, kind of a CIA experimentation side effect <laughs> thriller, if that makes sense. In fact, we were just watching something the other day about it was a doc, it was more of a documentary about the guy that committed suicide or supposedly committed suicide, jumped out the window. Um, and uh, sorry, I don't have my guitar, do I? <laughs> You're late, Mr. Benny. You're gonna have to go back. Um, I'll try to get back to the beginning of this video soon and and make sure that there's not a million ads. I apologize. It just takes me. They they don't finish uh, processing the video for about 12 hours, so I can't do anything for the 12 hours. And if I'm not, I'm probably in bed by 11 o'clock tonight. So in 12 hours, I'll be asleep. So that means it'll probably be another 12 hours before I can log in and go, okay, get rid of all these ads. Okay. So I'm going to sign off. I'm going to, I got some things I got to do. And then um, I um, will, I've already done the diagrams for these, uh, the new ones um, for, for, for Friday. We're going to do, uh, we're, we're going to do a Dorian. Now, remember when we did, the modes, and if you want to, you can look back. I think modes were back in lesson 12, 13 or something like that. Uh, we're at lesson 123. So if you go back to lesson 13, you'll see modes, I believe, something like that. Uh, it's easy to find if you just start scrolling through them. The, um, I, we did the modes in the key of C. So the Dorian key then was D Dorian. Um, and this is going to be A Dorian. So it's going to be basically that G major scale that you see right here, okay, Boop, right there, but starting on A. So start on the A note and go all the way up to G and then to A again, and that will be um, A Dorian. And I'll write that out when we uh, we do this uh, uh, Friday, okay? All right, God bless you guys. Thanks a lot. Bye, Holly. Bye, Ice. David, good to see you. Jan. Sorry, Mr. Be Mr. Benny, I, you missed it. We got to go back, okay? God bless you. Bye-bye.